And back in my childhood, in the town of South Anthrax, here's another thing that used to make science awful difficult. As our famous local poet used to say, you can look at fine bugs in our local museum, you can look all you like, but they're too small to see them. So my new, new museum will make small things big. You can really see things like this common house fly when it's blown up a quarter of a million times. You can actually see the thousands of small segments that make up the complex eye of the fly. But we can't go around blowing up every small thing in the world a quarter of a million times its natural size. So when we enlarge a drop of stagnant pond water, we make it only 250 times. But that's big enough to see the naviculi, the spirogyra, and the amoebas, to say nothing of the paramecium giganticus, the rotifera, and the zygnemas. Hmm? Of course, we'll not only make small things big, we'll make big things small. Like the pyramids of Egypt, a dozen square miles and 2,500 people, all reduced so small that you can stand there and look down like a giant. You can see what we believe happened back in the year 2600 BC, how the stones were quarried and moved on wooden sleds. They didn't know about wheels, so they lugged them up the side of the growing pyramids by manpower. With models such as this, we'll take you all the way up through history right through the present and into the future to complete model power plants run by atomic energy. But there'll be more than just models in this museum. I'll have the real thing too, so people can get the feel of them. Like a complete ship's bridge with all the latest modern navigation devices. They'll all work too, and you'll learn how to work them. Okay, all set gang. Tell you what, I'll take over the engine room to stand by, and uh, why don't you take over and Signal full speed ahead when you get the command. Uh, you're the captain this trip, so I'll give you a magnetic compass course to steer here, and be sure you keep it right on course because you're taking over the manual control wheel now. Why don't you keep a sharp lookout ahead? Be sure there are no ships as we go out of the harbor here. Now, when you get to the open sea, why don't you take over control of the ship here at this uh, gyro pilot stand steering wheel? Because once I get the course here and you get it set, all we have to do is turn this handle and the ship will automatically be steered itself. Uh, if the wind or the waves take it off course, our master gyro detects it, the rudder is moved, and it's put right back on course, steering better than you or I could. So we'll take care of that. Um, why don't you take the uh, depth recorder there, that's right, switch it on, and that records the depth automatically. Notice the lines there? Well, we're sending out supersonic sound signals, which go down to the bottom of the ocean and bounce back up again. The time required for them to reach the bottom of the ocean back in is recorded, uh, by that graph, giving us automatically the depth either in fathoms or feet. Now, if we should have bad weather, we can use our radar. This is the machine that sends out uh, radar signals. They bounce off objects and come back on the screen where they appear as blobs of light. Why don't you look in and see if you can see a picture as though we were cruising down uh, Boston Harbor. You see anything in there now? You should get a nice picture there. See? There's Castle Island. And, well, there's some docks. There's a ship close by to starboard. There's a navigation buoy, and there's Logan Airport. It'll take you probably a while to interpret those blobs, but uh, you can do it after a little bit of practice, I'm sure. And besides having real things that work, we'll have some real animals. They'll work too. Not just stuff, but live ones. For one thing, you can study them in action. For another, you can straighten out a lot of misconceptions, like, is an owl blind in daylight? I'll have men right here who know how to answer your questions. Well, now you've been asking me questions about uh, owls. I'm going to ask you one. First of all, how much do you think Spooky weighs? 20 pounds. 20 pounds. 30. 30. 14. 14. Golly, that's very, very good guesses. But actually, you're all wrong. Although Spooky is a very tall and big owl, standing almost 21 inches high, with a wingspan of four and a half feet, he only weighs two and three-quarter pounds. Wow. Now, one of the most amazing things about the owl is their ability to turn their heads. Many people believe that the owl can go around and around and around. What he really does is start in the front and turn his head halfway around in either direction. Let's see if we can do that a little bit. <laughs> 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 
Now, the reason the owl can do this is because he has 14 <laughs> neck bones, or twice as many as you and I. Uh, he has to be able to have these because he lacks the ability to roll his eyes in their sockets. And believe it or not, even a long-necked giraffe has only seven neck bones. Now, the most interesting thing about the owl is the fact that uh, the old story about owls being blind in the daytime isn't true. Now, the only reason the owl isn't found in the daytime is because the animal that he hunts prefers to come out at night. So the owl generally sleeps during the daytime and does his hunting at night. And that's the kind of thing that we have going on all day long on every floor of our museum. As you see, these men in my museum just don't loaf around waiting to answer questions. They pop up all over the place and start talking about things. Sometimes about the gall darndest things you ever heard. <clears throat> nothing, there's nothing in the world that we can be absolutely sure of until it's tested and you can't even be sure of something familiar like your own voice. In other words, you don't want to take things for granted in the world of science because your own voice with which you are very familiar is, whether you know it or not, very dependent upon what you have in your lungs at the time. In other words, you breathe air day in and day out and you get, as a result, a noise or sound that you're very much accustomed to and expect. What do you think would happen if one day, instead of breathing in air, you breathed in something much lighter than air, like helium? Well, if you did that, you'd have something that weighed much less than air, and therefore you'd have sound waves that weren't, weren't at all like the ones that you ordinarily every day produce. Let me show you what I mean. I'll get rid of this air and take in some helium. And then when I talk to you, you see my voice is quite a bit different than it was before. And this isn't something that I sit up nights practicing. It's the effect of helium. And you've noticed that as I talk and get back to air, I'm very back very well back to where I was. And I also want you to know that the quality is not the only thing that's, that's affected. It's also the, the range of my voice. Let's listen while I sing to you. I can sing this high with my ordinary voice, although I'm not a professional singer. <laughs> do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la. That's about as far as I can go with my voice, but let's try it with a little bit of helium. Do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do, re, mi, fa, sol. You see? Now, before I show you... My gosh, this stuff is catching. Before I show you any more of these demonstrations, I think I ought to get you thinking about what kind of a building you're going to put all this stuff in. This is what we had back in South Anthrax. But it wouldn't do for you, and you wouldn't be able to buy it even if you wanted to. This front half has been sold to the proprietor of a grade B fish market, and this back half, which was known as the chipmunk wing, was blown far out of town during the blizzard of 98. So you need something new and something pretty special, perhaps like this, a museum that already exists up in Boston. In fact, it was from Boston's new Museum of Science that I stole all my ideas everything you've been looking at. With the permission and assistance of the staff, some of whom you've met, and the director, Bradford Washburn. Brad, how do you actually get a Museum of Science started anyhow? Well, Dr. Seuss, there are two surefire easy ways. <laughs> One, if you have lots of money, and two, if somebody gives you a lot of money, preferably a combination of the two. But most museums have to start out the hard way, with just an idea, a group of community leaders, your trustees, who will stick behind you. Before you do anything, get out and see other museums. See what they're doing, what they're doing right, and what they're doing wrong. Then make a plan for a complete museum, the whole thing, even though you have funds enough only to build a broom closet. In Boston, we started by building the smallest possible unit, just enough to get people interested in what we were going to do. We wanted something like this, a simple, functional plant. You see, we learn from other museums that visitors usually will climb up one flight and down one flight to look at exhibits. On the upper floors of our central building, we've planned for our offices and our workshops where the exhibits that you've been seeing will be built. Down below will be our library and the Hall of Man and Medicine and Public Health to tell people about themselves and how they can be fixed when they're out of order. This wing over here, the Hall of Nature, will show the raw materials of man's world. And this Hall of Science and Industry over here 
will show how man, who you've learned about here, works with the materials from over here to produce the marvelous devices of modern technology. The planetarium shows you how man fits into the scheme of the universe. Inside the giant dome, an outlandish monster projector will recreate the clock-like wheeling of the planets and the shifting patterns of the heavens. Our projector will show you the stars at the equator or the poles, carry you forward a thousand years or back to the skies at the time of Christ's birth. Over here, in showing you man's relationship to his environment, the theater of electrical science may be the most important part of our whole plant. For electrical forces are basic in nature. Whether you're dealing with the structures of tiny individual atoms or tremendous energy transformations within the sun.